Let every man be swift to hear, but slow to speak and slow to anger. And we heard from the Holy Gospel, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will teach you all truth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, perhaps we should give a little title to our sermon this morning. Maybe it could be to judge or not to judge. Echoing Shakespeare, to judge or not to judge, that is the question. Hmm. In the East, some honor an unnamed monk known as the Uncondemning Monk. His feast is on March 30th. He was said to have been lazy and undisciplined in prayer, as well as all other aspects of his life. Due to this, the brethren were surprised at the monk's joy as he lay on his deathbed. The brother monks asked him the reason for his joy, to which he replied, I have just seen the angels, and they showed me a page with all my many sins. I said to them, The Lord said, Judge not, that ye be not judged. I have never judged anyone, and I hope in the mercy of God that he will not judge me. And the angels tore up the sheet of paper. Hearing this, the monks were filled with wonder. So the story goes. Now, does this mean we should not make any judgments? No. For his majesty himself, our Lord Jesus Christ, teaches us to make judgments, saying, For every tree is known by its fruit. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So our Lord is saying it is possible to make a just judgment upon men of this world, even while we're still in the world, by looking at their fruits, at their words, at their deeds. But, on the other hand, he also teaches in another place that we must be careful not to enter into what is called Rash judgment, jumping to conclusions. Thus, His Majesty says in the Sermon on the Mount, Judge not that you may not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. Now listen to St. Augustine. Make the proper distinctions here. He comes to our aid. He says, Concerning those things which are known to God, Unknown to us, we judge our neighbors at our peril. What are these things he's speaking of? Motives, intentions of the heart, the final destiny of a man. We don't know those things, at least not very easily. St. Augustine goes on. Of these the Lord has said, judge not that you may not be judged, but... Concerning things which are open and public evils, we may and must, must judge and rebuke. But still with charity and love, hating not the man but the sin, detesting not the vicious man but the vice, the disease more than the sick man. For unless the open adulterer, thief, habitual drunkard, traitor, or proud man were judged and punished, in them would be fulfilled what the blessed martyr Cyprian hath said. He who sues a sinner with flattering words provides fuel for his sin. He who sues a sinner with flattering words provides fuel for his sin. In the Apocalypse of St. John, the four living creatures, that is the Gospels, are said to be full of eyes round about and within. Meaning that everything is known to God. He sees all and is able to judge all things, including the secret intentions of the heart within man. The eyes are within. 
He knows the motives, the whys, and the wherefores of the heart. And furthermore, this symbolizes that the gospel provides us the standard, the ruler, as it were, by which all sound and legitimate judgments are made. When eating in the house of Simon the leper, his majesty put a case before the proud man about debts and forgiveness of sins. When Simon answered rightly, our blessed Lord said to him, Thou hast judged justly. He did the same thing with the parable of the Good Samaritan, putting a case before the men. Who was the neighbor? Some didn't act as a good neighbor. They had to make a judgment upon men. What was our Lord doing here? Training men how to judge according to the gospel. In other words, we can judge without sinning. Last Sunday, that is Mother's Day, we reflected on the life of St. Monica, the patroness of mothers, and how her conversion began in the wine cellar after a servant made a judgment upon her, calling her a drunkard because she had been drinking too much wine. It cut to the heart, it stung, but it saved her soul. It was the beginning of her conversion. We can judge, and His Majesty, our Lord and King, has given us the measuring stick. So faithful and true Catholics, possessing the deposit of the faith, the Holy Gospel, are the most qualified to judge in this world. If we are not able to judge, who is? We have the right and true ruler. We have the standard. Without the ruler, many fall into rash judgments. They fail in their judgments. Thus the same. A crooked measuring rule makes even straight things appear crooked. Now think about it. How many today are misjudging things because they have abandoned or even openly rejected the straight ruler? It is becoming increasingly dangerous for good Catholics to speak and act as Catholics have always spoken and acted. That is, to speak and act according to the perennial teachings of our holy church and our holy faith. People who do so are losing their jobs. Some are being jailed. Some are being suppressed. Others are belittled, called all sorts of names like fundamentalists. Yeah, he's a fundamentalist. Still others are being killed outright. Yes, we can judge. But we must keep in mind at the same time, it's very easy to misjudge. Even when we have the deposit of the faith, we have the ruler. Humans are notoriously bad judges. Thus, we should be slow to speak, slow to judge, and wait for the spirit of truth to reveal things more and more until it is safe to make a sound judgment. Now, we spend millions in the courtrooms trying to get a just judgment, and often they end up being rash judgments. They fail. How wonderful, therefore. Oh, how wonderful. How needed will be the final judgment where all things will be revealed But surely this is why the saints, like Augustine, cried out, What man can judge rightly concerning another? Our whole daily life is filled with rash judgments. He of whom he had despaired is converted suddenly and becomes very good. He from whom we had anticipated a great deal suddenly fails and becomes very bad. most easily fall into rash judgment simply because they let self-love, anger, envy blind them such that they wrongly go about judging the words and actions of others and they interpret their motives almost always for the worse. I am sure you will agree 
there are very few, if any, uncondemning monks in our world today. No wonder the prophet Jeremiah exclaimed, The heart is perverse above all things and unsearchable. Who can know it? I am the Lord who searcheth the heart and prove the reins, who give to everyone according to his way and according to the fruit of his devices. St. Paul says, Judge not before the time. Until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise from God. St. Augustine says, when it is uncertain with what intention things are done, construe it for the better. Put the best light upon it you can. The imitation of Christ says, turn your attention upon yourself. And beware of judging the deeds of other men. For in judging others, a man often makes mistakes and easily sins. Whereas in judging and taking stock of himself, he does something that is always profitable. St. Philip Neri said, holiness is in the width of three fingers. Meaning that by mortifying our judgment, our understanding, we can gain great holiness. Now, keeping these warnings in mind, it is important to understand the duties of our state and life very often require a judgment be made upon other men. We cannot escape it. It must be done. Parents have to make judgments on who is fit to look after their children or who may or may not be their companions. Employers have to judge whether an applicant is capable for a position. The church herself specifies that certain of her members, most notably those in the hierarchy, the pope, the bishops, the priests, are to pass judgment on others at certain times. For example... In the 1962 instruction for the sacrament of penance, the church says, a confessor should keep in mind above all that he holds the office of both judge and physician. Priest is a judge in confession. This is repeated in the 1983 Code of Canon Law. In hearing the confessions, the priest is to remember that he is equally a judge and a physician. Now, judges make judgments upon people. In another place, the 1962 instruction is very specific. The priest must take great pains to decide, that is, to make a judgment in which instances absolution should be given, denied or deferred, lest he absolve such as are indisposed for this benefit. The Council of Trent declares... The absolution of the priest is after the manner of a judicial act by which sentence is pronounced by him as by a judge. Clearly, a priest in confession is a judge. It's only one example of an official, God-given, God-sanctioned duty of some men making legitimate judgments upon other men in this world. Now, bishops and priests have many such duties to judge. St. Peter passed judgment on Simon Magus, the magician, from whom we derive the word simony. Looking at him, he said, keep thy money to thyself to perish with thee. Thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Do penance, therefore, for this thy wickedness. And pray to God that perhaps this thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee. For I see that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bonds of iniquity. He made a judgment on a man. He's the Pope. That's his job. St. Paul passed judgment on the impure man at Corinth saying, I indeed absent in body but present in spirit have already judged as though I were present, him that hath done has so done this evil act. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In the decree concerning the things to be observed and avoided, 
in the celebration of Holy Mass, the Council of Trent states in a discussion on wayward priests, quote, so that irreverence may be avoided, each bishop in his own diocese shall permit no one who is publicly and notoriously wicked either to minister at the altar or to be present at the sacred services, end quote. In the 2005, the Curial Office dedicated to education produced a set of guidelines on the subject of who may be admitted to the priesthood, stating, This dicastery, in accord with the Congregation of Divine Worship and the Discipline of Sacraments, believes it necessary to state clearly that the church cannot admit to the seminary or to holy orders those who support the so-called gay culture. They use those words, gay culture. Note the wording. Even those who use the word gay in any way that is positive or affirming should not be allowed to enter the seminary or be ordained. A judgment needs to be made. This is a political term. It's loaded with impurity. It is of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it speaks about the heart of the one who supports its use. He is not to be promoted. We make a judgment. Clearly, His Majesty has taught us that we can judge correctly, most notably in matters concerning faith and morals, something we are all called to do to preserve our soul using the straight rule of the gospel as our guide. What is more, our Lord has given each of us duties of our state that require us to judge without fail in certain cases. For prelates of the church, this duty is grave as it touches on the salvation of souls, including their own, if they fail to fulfill this duty As we heard earlier, St. Augustine sums things up very well. Concerning those things which are known to God and unknown to us, we judge our neighbors at our peril. Of these the Lord hath said, Judge not that you may not be judged. But concerning things which are open and public evils, people coming out and saying they're gay, That's a public evil. We may and must judge and rebuke, but still with charity and love, hating not the man but the sin, detesting not the vicious man but the vice, the disease more than the sick man. For unless the open adulterer, thief, habitual drunkard, traitor, or proud man were judged and punished, in them would be fulfilled what the blessed martyr Cyprian has said. He who sues a sinner with flattering words provides fuel for his sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.